1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. So Paul was left at Athens alone. He sent Timothy to the Thessalonians. This shows Paul could walk alone if needed with only the Lord's company. And this shows that Paul isn't just a soul winner, but also a true minister. He cared about the souls even after they were converted. Many soul winners will lead a soul to Jesus Christ and not come back. This is because they care more about numbers than they do the actual souls. And 1 Thessalonians 3.2 says, And sent to Motheus, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow laborer, and the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Notice Paul doesn't just send an email or a gift. He sends one of his best fellow laborers in the gospel of Christ. This shows he cared more about who was going to comfort them and teach them than other people. And Timothy preaches the gospel about Jesus Christ, the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here, Timothy is called a fellow laborer, and Paul also refers to him as a work fellow in Romans 16, 21. And notice, Paul calls Timothy his brother, and this would be a brother in Christ. Not only this, but he is a minister of God. God has ministers, and the devil has ministers. As it says in 2 Corinthians eleven fifteen. And Paul sent someone he knew wasn't a wolf in sheep's clothing. He knew Timothy wasn't a minister of Satan, disguising himself as a minister of righteousness. And there is more than one gospel in the Bible if you recognize differences. Gospel means good tidings or good news. And Timothy was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the first thing we see about the faith of the Thessalonians, that's what we're going to talk about, the faith of the Thessalonians. And the first thing is that it needed establishing and comforting. As a new convert, you need a trustworthy person like Timothy to establish you in the faith. Acts 16.5 talks about establishing people in the faith. It said, and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily a new christian needs to be established in the basic doctrines of the bible he needs to understand the words of salvation like imputation justification propitiation redemption and so on he needs to know about heaven and hell he needs to know everything he can about jesus christ so that he doesn't get deceived by a false christ it's good to get meat from the Bible, but the Bible talks about newborn babes and says that they need milk. 1 Peter 2 and verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Everyone can take milk, but not everyone can take meat. You need to get the basic and simple things down first. Some ministries are based only on strange and meaty doctrines. And Hebrews 13, 9 says, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. So don't spend all your time listening to someone who has their whole ministry revolving around the fallen angels in Genesis 6. It's good to know all of these strange doctrines, but don't let your mind stay occupied with them all the time. You need to be established in the basic things of the Bible. While on the other extreme, many Christians stay away from any doctrine that they see as strange. They would never even consider the fact that Adam and Eve ate a grape, or that the son of, sons of God in Genesis 6 are fallen angels, or that there is a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, or that people in the lake of fire will have a body of a worm, they won't even seek to find out about things like that because they are too weird. And they forget that the Bible is a supernatural book. They have a hard time believing something that they haven't heard before. But like the Thessalonians, all new converts need to be established in the faith. 
Paul sends Timothy to do this for the Thessalonians. And this proves God uses men to help you in your faith. Unlike the men who are always screaming, don't be following a man. It's okay to follow a man as long as you keep the Bible the final authority. You can learn from any man, but always filter everything he says through the Bible. Paul says more about comforting and establishing the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 2.17 Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3, But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. In Ephesians 6, 21 through 22, Paul sends out Tychicus to comfort the hearts of the Ephesians. He does the same thing with the Colossians in chapter 4 and verses 7 through 8, just like he does here with Timothy. So Timothy was going to comfort them concerning their faith. So how would he do this? He would use the Bible. Because Romans 15, 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. It would be hard to comfort people with the Bible when you are chopping it up and taking out the parts you don't like. When a man changes just one word in the Bible, it shows that he is crooked. Even if the person is a good, godly scholar, all men are still sinners. Schofield changed words in his Bible and his notes, and he sinned in his own reference Bible. Many men won't accept the common man's reference Bible or the Ruckman reference Bible because they just don't agree with the doctrine in it. Yet they will take Schofield's study Bible, which changes the words. Do you agree with changing the words? I'm not saying you shouldn't have a Schofield or any other study Bible, but the other two reference Bibles I mentioned are the only ones I know of that don't correct the Bible in the notes. But you get comfort through the scriptures and you need all the scriptures. You know how the scriptures give comfort? Because you can put all your trust and faith in the scriptures. But when a man changes the words, he takes away that comfort. And his labor then becomes in vain. He becomes a liar and a crook. The scriptures strengthen your faith because faith cometh by hearing. Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more you get up and hear a preacher or teacher exalt the words of God and brag about God, the more you will believe in God and his book. If you get up and hear a guy talking about the Greek says this and that and this word's really supposed to be this, then you'll start losing your faith in the Bible and then you'll lose your comfort. If you dedicate all your time listening to men like James White or any other Bible corrector, then you will end up doubting the Bible. Not only this, but the prophecies and the scriptures bring comfort. When you get in the Bible and read about heaven, your future glorified body, the millennial kingdom, and Jesus coming back at the second coming, then that brings comfort. 1 Corinthians 14.3 says, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. We get all our prophecies from the scriptures. And not only this, but Timothy will comfort them by just bragging about the God of all comfort. The Thessalonians are going through tribulation and afflictions and they need comfort from God. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. 1 Thessalonians 3.3 3 says that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. If a man is established and comforted concerning his faith, then he will be less likely moved by afflictions. So we see the Thessalonians 
not only had a faith that needs establishing and comforting, but also a faith that wouldn't move during afflictions. The best way to not be moved in any given situation is to put your trust in God to get you out of it or give you strength to get through it. And Psalms says, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. And Psalm 62, 6, he only is my rock and my salvation he is my defense, I shall not be moved. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. therefore my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Acts 20, 23, and 24. It says, Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. And this is Paul talking, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So if you stay in prayer, Bible reading, and holy Christian living, then you will be less likely to be moved when afflictions come. Some martial artists are given demonic powers to not be moved when pushed by an opponent, and they got this supernaturally, just like a Christian can get supernatural power from God to not be moved in afflictions. We may be appointed to afflictions and tribulations, but we aren't appointed to wrath. Jesus Christ opening the seals in Revelation chapter 6 shows that even the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble is the wrath of God being poured out. And that's further proof that the church leaves at the beginning or before it even starts, before this time period even starts and we're not going halfway through it like some people teach. Some people teach that the first half isn't the wrath of God, but Revelation chapter 6, when Jesus Christ opened the seals, that proves that that's the wrath of God being poured out. And another thing we are appointed to is death. There are exceptions to this, like men in the Old Testament like Enoch and believers who are alive during the rapture, but as a general rule, every man's going to die. Hebrews 9.27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. But back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 4. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. Paul wants them to have the same faith as he has. And that's faith that will withstand tribulation. Romans 12, 12 says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Romans 5, 3, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Notice how the word tribulations isn't referring to the tribulation that you find in the book of Revelation. And Christians aren't going through the tribulation of that time period. Christians are going through tribulations right now as we speak. You may be going through tribulations right now in your life. People will use these verses to show that Christians will go through the time of Jacob's trouble. But did you know that the tribulation isn't actually the title of that time period, even though we all say it all the time? But it's not the title of that time period that's coming in the future. The correct title is the time of Jacob's trouble not the church's trouble. The Great Tribulation wouldn't be a title. It's actually just a description. And Christian suffering is what gets you rewards when you leave this world. 2 Timothy 2.12 If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Romans 8.17 And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. 2 Timothy 3.12 Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, 
1 Peter 4.16 Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And 1 Peter 3.14 But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 4. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. So Paul taught, told them they would go through tribulation, and it came to pass. Do you know how to spot a false prophet? They prophesy something, and it doesn't come to pass. So this leads us to the next point concerning the faith of, faith of the Thessalonians. They had their faith in the right men. Many will place their faith in men who are giving prophecies that aren't found in Scripture. And you can see many videos all over the internet saying something is going to happen on a certain date, and then it doesn't happen. When Paul said something was going to happen, it happened. And he was getting his prophecies from the right source. Any Christian can prophesy. You can do this from quoting, quoting the Bible verses about the future. When you tell someone if they don't get saved, they will burn in a lake of fire, then you are prophesying. Prophecy to be wary of is prophecies that aren't found in the Bible. But next we see that the Thessalonians had faith to withstand attacks from Satan. And that's because 1 Thessalonians 3, 5 says, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Paul says his labor would be in vain if the Thessalonians went back to their old ways. Paul wasn't just interested in their souls being saved. He wanted them to live holy, justly, and unblameably. He also knew that Satan would try to tempt them. And Bible proof for the tempter being Satan is found in Matthew 4 and verse 3. Once you get saved, the devil will send false prophets and teachers to try to make you stumble and never grow in grace. When I first got saved, the devil sent a Pentecostal oneness preacher to try and trip me up. He told me I wasn't saved unless I got baptized in Jesus' name only. Later on, this guy is getting in trouble for going to churches to pick up small children and kidnapping kids off the street. And the devil also sent several other of these oneness people to try and confuse me about the Bible. They continued to preach Acts 2.38 to me out of context. But this just caused me to study more and learn what Acts 2.38 was really saying. I was also tempted to go back to many of my old sins after being saved. But the longer you go without these pet sins in your life, the easier they will be to defeat. And in Matthew chapter 4, the devil came to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ. After every temptation, the Lord quoted scripture. One of the best ways to fight temptation is to quote Bible verses pertaining to that temptation. After Jesus was done quoting these verses, the Bible says that the devil leaveth him in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 4. And then if you read James chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had, hath promised to them that love him. We all get tempted, even the best Christians. Many people consider Paul to be one of the best Christians to ever live, and Paul was also tempted. Galatians 4.14 says, And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despise not, nor rejected." But receive me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So you see that Paul was even tempted. And the Thessalonians were under heavy persecution. And they probably didn't have the same temptations as many of us Christians have in America today. 1 Timothy 6, 9 says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. We have so much money and stuff in America that it may cause us to be tempted a lot more than someone who doesn't have very much money or things. The Thessalonians were most likely tempted to not follow the Lord and Paul because of the persecution they would face for doing so. 
Paul says he sent to know their faith in verse 5 because he wanted to make sure they were still trying their best in their Christian walk. Remember that with every temptation there is a way to escape. 1 Corinthians 10.13 there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Many times you may think that the things which the devil is doing to you are only happening to you personally. But if you read 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9, it says, Be, be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So people are, go other Christians are going through the same thing that you're going through. And don't underestimate the devil. Stay reading your Bible, praying, and confessing your sins to God. Satan beguiled the first woman that ever lived, who walked and talked with God, in Genesis 3.13. And it says he beguiled her in 1 Corinthians 11. So if he can trick the first two people, if he, if he can trick the first woman into sinning, then he can definitely trick us into sinning. If he can trick men like David and Abraham and Moses into sinning, then he can trick us. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one to never give in to temptation. Hebrews 4.15 For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. But not only this, the Thessalonians had faith that gave comfort and joy to others. Let's read 1 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 9. But when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, charity is a love for other Christians, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. So Timothy came back and gave a good report of the faith and charity of the Thessalonians. And 2 Thessalonians 1.3 says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Charity is a love you have for other Christians. Knowing the good faith and charity of the Thessalonians brought comfort, as it says in verse 7, and joy, as it says in verse 9, it brought these things to the heart of Paul. We should have a good enough faith that it produces fruit and brings blessing and comfort to other Christians. And all of Paul's afflictions and distress, as it says in verse 7, he found comfort in knowing the fact that the Thessalonians hadn't given in to temptation and gone back into the world like someone like Demas. As it talks about in 2 Timothy 4.10. And in verse 9 he is basically saying that he thanks God, he has thanked God so much for them. What more thanks can he give? They have rose above and beyond his expectations. Paul says in verse 8, For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. What he means by stand fast is found in 2 Thessalonians 2.15. It says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast, and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. He wants them to stand fast and not move or go back to their old ways, our old traditions. He wants them to hold the traditions which they have been taught, whether by word or the, the epistle. Paul uses this phrase, stand fast, many times in his epistles. Philippians 4, one says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. And that's how you got to stand fast is in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16.13 says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, 
Quit you like men, be strong. Galatians 5, 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. If they continue to stand fast, then Paul will be able to live. He's not going to physically die if they don't. It's just an expression. Paul gets comfort knowing his converts and Christians are standing fast in the faith. Paul is the one who said to live is Christ and to die is gain. In Romans 1.12, that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. So he's comforted together by other Christians' faith. Instead of finding comfort in the dan downfall of other Christians and the shortcomings of his enemies, Paul is finding comfort in people succeeding in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many Christians seem to get jealous or angry when a brother or sister in Christ is succeeding. That's a horrible way to live your life and it's unpleasing to God when you're glad when bad things happen to people and mad when good things happen to people. This shows that you're selfish and this is not how the Bible teaches that we should be towards other people, especially other Christians. But the Thessalonians had faith that could still use perfecting. 1 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12 says, Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way into you and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men even as we do toward you. Paul said he was praying night and day and this shows that Paul wasn't just a daytime Christian. Many people will act like good godly men in front of the world but when they get home they are doing abominable things. Maybe everyone thinks you are a godly man but yet you come home and watch filth. You may go home and have unnecessary fighting and clamor. And Paul was praying at night. And we should follow this example. He wasn't going out to bars and watching bad things on TV. He was praying. He was praying that he might see their face. Have you ever been so annoyed by someone that you couldn't stand to see them coming? And you'll say, I hate the sight of them. Many times we can just get annoyed by the sight of someone's face. We should pray that we can follow another one of Paul's examples and long to see the face of other Christians. But the end of verse 10 says, And might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. And Paul isn't trying to brag, but God has equipped him with the wisdom and knowledge to be able to help perfect the faith of the saints. Even though the Thessalonians were doing well, they could still use some perfecting. And all of us could use some perfecting in our faith. Our Christian walk is far from perfect. And nothing is funnier than when a holiness preacher gets up and says that he is sinless. But notice verse 12 says, The Lord make you to in increase and abound in love. Their love could still increase and abound more than it presently did. If you are as close to God as you should be, then you know there are some things you can still try to perfect and increase. Paul knew he was a sinner and that he wasn't perfect. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he said he was the least of the apostles. Then in Ephesians 3, 8, he said he is the least of all saints. In 1 Timothy 1, 15, he says he is the chief of sinners. So the closer he got to God, the more he realized how much of a sinner he was. And then 1 Thessalonians 3.11, it says, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way into you. Paul prays to get to the Thessalonians. He knows he can only get there with the help of the Lord. And he wants the Lord to direct his way to them. Proverbs 3.6 says, In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Psalms 37, 23, 
The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Moving on to 1 Thessalonians 3.13, it says, To the end he may, establish, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Once again, Paul talks about them being unblameable and holy. Further proof, he isn't just interested in getting as many souls saved as possible, but actually discipling the souls that are saved after they get saved. This shows he is a true minister. He isn't on a schedule to see how many souls he can lead to the Lord in a day. Some soul winners would rather lead ten men to Jesus Christ, who will never amount to anything, than to just lead one man to the Lord who turns out to be holy, just and unblameable in his Christian walk. The ten would go on and never lead anyone else to Jesus Christ, while the one man who was faithful after salvation would go on to win more souls, and that would actually produce more spiritual grandchildren for the soul winner. But First Thessalonians 3.13, To the end he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, with all his saints. And last but not least, the Thessalonians had faith in the second coming of Jesus Christ. If you are saved, then you will get to come back with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you were going to come back with him, then you would have already had to have been with him. And this is further proof for the rapture. At the rapture, he comes back to get us. And at the second coming, he comes back with us. There are basically two aspects of the second coming. First, he privately comes to get us at the rapture. And then publicly, he comes back with us. And every eye shall see him, as it says in Revelation 1-7. And Deuteronomy 33 and verse 2 said, And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Jude one fourteen and Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And in Joel chapter two it gives a good description of us coming back with the Lord Jesus Christ in our glorified bodies. Joel chapter two and verse two says, A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth, the land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble. As a strong people set in battle array, before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness, they shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks." Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great, for he is strong, that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? And this will be a scary time for the lost people on this earth. At this time the Lord comes back with a vengeance. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.8 says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank <laughs> you.